again. Do we have any announcements since the last time? Or are we, we we're, we're good? We're good. All right. Um, oh my, hey, my phone's ringing again. Hi, phone. Different, different number. Um, we're, we're good on streaming and we're good on, on video. All right. So uh, one of the things that our CFP says, uh, you know, hey, we're looking for innovative talks, et cetera, et cetera, and updates on past projects and things that people have done. So uh, Mudge came here last year and uh, announced the uh, cyber fast track program that DARPA is putting on. Uh, we were very honored to have him here and, and uh, come to ShmooCon and, and kick that whole thing off. Um, and so he's back uh, the year following to let everybody know how CFT has been doing and to encourage more people to participate in the program. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to uh, world famous Mudge. Thank you. We'll try this one. Can you guys hear me all right? Okay, good. We'll try not to spill the water over the, uh, the computer here. So, um, <clears throat> as usual, I always enjoy uh, Bruce's uh, talks, especially when they start to go into his little uh, rants there and become more of a Bruce sort of thing. Uh, and I was just thinking as I was getting up here, I mean, I, I, I agree with that. And, and the big question is, you know, what does it take to be a good steward of the computer security community, which I consider myself to be a part of going way back to the um, uh, early 90s, uh, even. And um, <clears throat> as folks have, many folks have asked me, like, why the hell did you go and actually, you know, decide to work inside government? Um, and that was how I could actually contribute more to our community, because I had been uh, pushing for change on the outside uh, for years. Uh, and uh, I got the opportunity to actually go inside. I'm not sure they knew what they were bargaining for or what they were going to get, but I knew what I was going to try and give them on the inside, which is to hack the system from within. Um, so for me, it's not just about being a good steward of the uh, security community. As it turns out, I have an added responsibility, which is I am a steward of your taxpayer money now um, because I fund research, uh, and that research comes from discretionary taxpayer money, and I take that very, very seriously and I want it used in the most beneficial way that contributes back to our community where a lot of this innovation uh, actually comes from. So with that said, uh, how many people saw the keynote last year at uh, ShmooCon? Okay, smattering there. How many people have heard of uh, uh, Cyber Fast Track? Okay, how many people have uh, proposed to Cyber Fast Track? Oh, that's not bad. How many people are planning on proposing to it? Okay, cool. So for those of you that aren't familiar with it, I'll give a little recap. And for those of you who are watching this online or who find this on a YouTube uh, uh, video later on and, and want some context, just Google for a 2011 Schmookon DARPA Mudge uh, keynote and, uh, and they'll go through. But what I did is in that keynote, I actually um, <clears throat> made a couple promises and I want to uh, get back to see whether or not I, making these promises as to what I was going to try and pull off from inside the government actually uh, lived up to them or not. Uh, this is, come on, this is one slide as the recap. Uh, this is like a slide that's become a little infamous in uh, government circles because it, it uh, surprised people, angered certain people. Some of it seems a little counterintuitive. I use this in something called the Cyber Analytic Framework, which I helped uh, kind of re-steer the uh, help put together to re-steer the direction of the uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, in partial part uh, to this re-steering of the direction, the agency got a $500 million plus up. A lot of other folks were seeing cuts. Uh, we viewed that as a vote of confidence, that we are actually able to articulate some serious problems and start to make headway on them that other folks hadn't. So let me just um, uh, do a quick recap on this slide, take a few minutes, uh, and then we'll go into kind of like the did Mudge live up to the promises he made last year when he announced Cyber Fast Track or not, or um, is this another politician? <laughs> so uh, on the slide here, what we did is on the x-axis, we have uh, you know, the time, the dates, and on the y-axis, we put lines of code. Because people were trying to say, it feels like we're getting worse and worse. As Bruce just mentioned, we're dealing with the same damn problems in many cases that we have since 1970s. We're throwing more people at it, we're spending more money on it, but the problem seems to feel like it's getting worse and worse. Why the heck is this? Uh, and part of my job was to come up with different ways of actually articulating where this is, rather than just saying, oh, it's scary, the scarier it is, the more money you need to invest in it. Because that's not really a smart investment of your and my money always. So what I did is I uh, took uh, lines of code and I started plotting them over time. So on the blue line, I grabbed defensive software applications. And we saw the same trend in uh, regular applications and in operating systems, small ones, Minix, all the way up to like Windows 7 and Linux. 
Uh, and here we start on the left with like application layer firewalls and by the time we're moving up to 2005, unified threat management, we're at like 10 million lines of code. That's your IBMs, your CA Unicenters, your HP OpenViews, your Tivoli's, your HBSS for the government folks, it's the all-in-one sort of thing. Um, and it's just gotten larger and larger. So by comparison, I said, okay, well, what's the stuff all of these things are actually trying to combat? And how many lines of code does it take to write the bad stuff that these 10 million, 100 million lines of code solutions are trying to deal with? So I went and took my malware sample, uh, samples, which are a few thousand. Um, and for malware, I mean like viruses, worms, exploits, bots, and stuff like that. I went to the millworm uh, collection. I went to a bunch of other places, offensive computing and everything, and grabbed as much as I could and started counting through. And I counted the lines of code, and it was really interesting because that over time re remained relatively constant at about 125. And here's where a bunch of people will be like, you know, schmoo balls or it, that, that's crap. No, I've seen botnets that are 100,000 lines of code. You know, so what the heck's up with this? And I'm going, well, yeah, actually, and, and I looked back because I was surprised by it the first time I came up with it, and I have those bots net in, botnets in there. And for every one of those 120,000 line of code botnets, you know, how many SQL injection attacks are being counted? How many lines of code is in a SQL injection attack? You know, how many lines of code in the, bu in the buffer overflows? You're talking 20 to 200, depending on, like, the language you're writing and in the other parts there. This is just how the law of averages actually work. And other people would say, well, it's kind of unfair because, you know, that blue one, that 10 million line of code, it has to protect against all of those. And for the individual attacks, you know, just one of them has to get in to be successful. And I'm like, yes, you, you're correct. That's the freaking problem. Um, now, one other thing I'd like to point out on the, or actually a few more things I'd like to point on this slide. So, actually 125, if you look at, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some walking here. I don't know if the camera will follow me. If you look at 2 million where that is, half 2 million would be like 1 million right here, right? Half 1 million is 500,000, right? See where this red line is? If I had it at 125, you can't see the difference from the x-axis. So I actually pulled it up to about 125,000 just so you could see it. So actually that red line there is at 125,000. The actual lines of code were 125. What it means is if you're arguing over whether it's 125 or 125,000, it doesn't change the actual story that we're actually conveying here of the situation that we've gotten into. So a lot of folks said, well, that's just the nature of offense and defense. Um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, people go like, well, if I'm defending, you know, I have to defend every day. And if I'm successful, I'm just where I was the day before. I'm just, you know, defending. And if I'm attacking, you know, if I attack and I don't get in, no big deal. But if I attack and I get in, I win. So basically on defense, the, the, the story or the song that we hear is you got everything to lose and nothing to gain. And on offense, you got everything to gain and nothing to lose. Um, I'm not sure I really buy that entirely. Because I think the reason that we're on this blue line is that we've actually trained ourselves that this is how we do it. This is how the market actually wants it. If I want to build a product and give you updates every 11 months or something, you know, I'm going to put a team of people together and sell it to you. Um, I've seen hacks that Casper Dick has done. I've seen defensive hacks by a bunch of folks that are a few hundred lines of code, a few thousand lines of code. Crispin Cowan's Stack Guard, which was a DARPA-funded uh, program, which was kind of like the first uh, or the early stack canaries going out. That wasn't millions of lines of code. You know, you can come up with really decent defensive solutions, but for large industry, you know, you sell a product. And I think we've trained ourselves that what we, what we are trying to create to defend needs to be big, large, monolithic, because that's what's supporting the industries that are making them. And I don't think it's always the off, you know, that it's offense vice defense. So when I was back at the loft in the, in the 90s, uh, and uh, that period of time, which is actually why I put together Cyber Fast Track. Um, I wanted some resource. I thought we should be able to get government research money, um, that there wasn't any vehicle for it. Um, but back, back then, you know, we were on that 125 lines, whether it was offense or defense. So Cyber Fast Track is what we put together to say, how do we fund these people? How do we get to be on that red line? How do we actually start to fund projects there that are disruptive? And don't treat this as the whole, oh, well, if I'm going to get an award and contribute to the society, I've got to you know, put a team of people together that takes uh, years to actually do, that takes millions of dollars, sometimes your taxpayer dollars, and significant overhead always. You know, there are some cases where we need that, 
but not all of the cases. Um, so how do we actually do that and how do we find the ways to encourage these organizations? That's what I talked about last year where I announced um, you know, what cyber fast track was. And you know, that's kind of to try and reach back out to this community. It's not to try and get this community to solve DOD problems. That's actually, that fails in many, many ways, and I can go on and on about those. Uh, not the least of which is, you probably have no idea just how messed up some of those networks actually are, um, and it requires some different, you know, different approaches. But what Cyber Fast Track actually is trying to do is say, you know, these, you look around you, you know the small boutique companies, you know the pockets of innovation, you know the creativity. Um, <clears throat> you know, what are the areas that you're looking at going like, this is really fascinating, this is coming down the pike and I want to get ahead of it. This is the area that I need to solve, and that's where I should be able to look and say like, you're right. And that's good for all of us. And that's good for this community and we should be funding that. Because that's how we're actually going to make some differences there. So that was the goal of CFT. Um, now, one of the things I said, if, for anybody who's actually uh, watched it, and I went through and watched my keynote uh, last night to see like, what did I say? Um, in February of last year, I said it would take, uh, I, I had the money from Congress. Uh, we had it actually set up and palmed. Um, I just had to figure out legally how to get it through contracts, management, the legal office to make sure we were adhering to everything. Um, I said it'd probably go live in three months. Um, it took nine months. Uh, it took nine months. Uh, it was a significant hacking of the contracting to make sure we were adhering to all the different federal acquisition regulations. A lot of people were very resistant to it. You want to do what? You want to fund who? You want to do it in a different way than we've always done business? You know, why? I'm like, well, because we can't reach out to certain groups of people and fund their innovation that we'd like to. Um, and my favorite was, um, show me in the law where what you're trying to do is legal. <laughs> and it's it, particularly disturbing when it's a lawyer that does that, because I have to go, you do know how the law works, right? The law tells you what's illegal. It's not a white list. You know, you show me where in the law what I'm doing is not legal, and then we'll have a conversation. Because um, it is legal. Uh, it, it is just, it's different. And, and it's change, and it's change inside certain places that, to be honest, oftentimes are a little resistant to change. So three months turned into nine months. I apologize. I also said that well, I was going to try and make it really accessible, that at the end, my, my goal was that, you know, you'd have literally a seven-page contract, not one of these omnibuses, from the, the government uh, that would, you know, dozens and dozens of pages of legalese. So I said, you know, seven page commercial contract. So I was wrong again. It's a one page contract. Thanks. And I said that, um, I said that conferences like ShmooCon uh, and places like this with this community are where, I, you know, I'd really like to see, you know, CFT funded work being presented. That would be a sign that things have been successful. And I'm happy to say that even within just the four months of actually being live, we have at least one um, presentation at ShmooCon that is presenting cyber fast track funded work. We have a lot of the stuff at the conferences at B-Sides and other areas like that. Open source software going out. So we're actually making uh, uh, some headway there. And I figured, um, I'd actually go on and ask, answer a couple of the questions that we normally get, and then kind of I've got some money, some money shots at the, uh, at the end of uh, where we really turn some folks on their head. Um, so people say, what are the themes of it? So what sort of research you know, are you looking to fund? Uh, I got to make sure I follow the notes here. See, I have to clear the slides, but I don't have to clear my voice track. So some of these slides get reused, and then I just use a different voice track because you know, it's the government. These are all the little hacks and tricks that you end up learning about. Um, so in general, I labeled it as cyber. And the question is, what the heck is cyber? And I hate that phrase also. But I'll fight for the word hacker, um, because I don't think that hacker means criminal or that hacker should be a bad word. Um, I've given up on the fight for the word cyber. I don't care. They can have it. Um, so what it is is I mentioned uh, you figure out what the problems are in the areas that are interesting to you. Don't try and solve uh, DOD problems because this is about identifying where the research interests are aligned, not about trying to realign somebody else's interests to something that they might not be aligned with. Uh, we want to run a whole slew of projects. I had said we were going to run between 20 and 100 each year. And actually, on the back end of things, I said, you know, for, for my metrics internally, 20 the first year, 40 the second year, um, 80 uh, the third year. 
And in the first year, we're already, just within the first four months, well over that 20-year mark. So we've already beat the first-year metrics on the back end that we were uh, kind of shooting for. The hundreds of projects, that's that red line. You know, because we want a whole bunch of different eyes on a whole bunch of different things that are really interesting. You know, it, you should be able to surprise us, and, and that's what we should be funding. The fast and cheap, because uh, historically, when you look at traditional DOD-funded uh, research, it's looking at four-year, five-year long programs and efforts. And that's fine for certain areas. But you tell me what we're going to be dealing with or what the next new trend is five years down the road from now and guarantee that you know, you're pretty accurate on it, and I'll be amazed. Yeah, same as the last five, buffer overflows. So I, I wrote the paper that I actually sent to ALF1 that he, uh, that he used for his uh, smashing the stack for fun and profit. And I was like, oh, dude, do what you want with it. This stuff's going to be dead in like eight months. You know, I am just amazed that, uh, that we're still eking stuff out and that we still haven't dealt with that. So if you've got a novel way of disrupting that industry, that's great. That would be good. So yes, yeah, some cases like that. But should we have to spend hundreds of millions of, uh, of your taxpayer dollars and mine uh, over a period of five years to try and come up with the next, you know, thing? Or should we be able to come up with a whole slew of things in short-term turnarounds where you keep the intellectual property and you get to actually have the fun and we get to, like, you know, make it a dynamic game-theoretic process? where we're not like always responding, but where we're actually kind of driving where we want adversaries to move or where we want the industry to go to. I think that sounds fun. Thanks. Um, so the fast and cheap also, um, because again, the five years is just too long. You know, we're looking at cyber fast track of funding things that they're all less than 12 months before there's a proof of concept or a prototype or something like that. And the cheap part is, uh, if you ask me for like, you know, a million dollars for your cyber fast track program or half a million dollars, you know, I have to really look at it and go like, well, why should I be funding that through cyber fast track? Maybe you do need to go through the traditional programs that require, you know, teams of people to write the contract, six months worth of negotiations because I'm about to sign over a million dollars of your and my hard earned money, you know, for that. For cyber fast track, you know, do some small ones, fund your own research and development, keep the intellectual property. You know, it's the way of making sure you get to do the fun stuff that we like to do rather than just having to do it off hours or on weekends or, you know, oh, I've been meaning to get around to that. You know, it's going to save the world, but damn it, I got a day job. Um, and diversity, because that's, that's another part. Uh, this is that red line, these, those 10,000 you know, 10, uh, samples, not just offense, defense, just neat stuff that's small, agile, uh, adaptive. That gives you the opportunity to choose what your solution is. And you can herd the bad guy, whomever the bad guy is, to where you want them to operate. Because if every one of the solutions that we come up with as a society, public sector, private sector, I don't care, is like a 10 million or 100 million line solution that takes years to do, we go, oh, we're getting hit by X. Quick, start the, you know, start the machinery, come up with the solution. A couple years later, we have a solution. And the adversary just moves slightly to the side and undoes it. I would much rather say, hmm, well, I've got 70 solutions I could probably field right now that are all at various stages. Um, which ones make them move this way? Which ones would make them, the adversary move that way? Actually having you know, a good strategy is having multiple options. So my favorite process without output is uninteresting. Four months. Um, we reached out and tried to create a resource to a new community, the community that I came from, the community that you're all a part of, the community that I'm still trying to uh, champion uh, inside the government. And we've gotten about 100 proposals, which I am just tickled pink about. Uh, we, uh, of those, over 80% of them are from folks who are not the traditional DOD contractors, government contractors. Um, this is not exclu uh, exclusionary to them, uh, but we're trying to reach out and open up and fund new people with new ideas. So 80% of them have been from folks like you, which I think is just, is awesome. We've awarded almost 30. Um, it's actually 29. I can't keep this slide up to date, which is a lot of fun. And uh, uh, out of those, you know, almost all of them were entirely new to government funding. Now, this is the one that makes basically all the people in government, their jaws drop. They send their staffers over from, from your congressmen. They send the, uh, you know, the flag officers to go, how the heck did you do this? Because the time, from the time I received the contract, or the, sorry, the proposal, from the time I received the proposal inbound, and I read it and I say, this is awesome, this needs to be funded, 
to the time the performer is actually on contract and working and getting paid is averaging just over seven days. I, I run some non-cyber fast track programs and it's taken between six and almost 12 months to get an individual performer on that's from this particular community because it's so not set up for us to deal with. They're going like, oh, well, you got to go through DCA auditing and, and we need you to do cost plus fee and, you know, where's your accounting thing and what are your other creds and your cage codes and your blah, blah, blah going on. And, um, you know, and that, those were barriers to entry that precluded a lot of folks, you know, from this community from participating. And Cyber Fast Track has created a vehicle um, that's not a CIBR, it's not a grant, it's not one of the traditional BAAs, it's not a seedling, it's new. It was designed to make it accessible to fund the innovation and the research uh, that's coming out of this community to allow you to keep all of the commercial intellectual property for it. You want to go out and commercialize it and make millions of dollars? Good. We just want the technology to hit the streets and see the streets. You want to open source it? Great. That's good also. You know, you want to do whatever you want. It's your intellectual property. We want to understand what's possible within the government as to what are the possibilities out there? What is the state of the art? What can be changed in the state of the possible rather than the whole like, if you give me $10 million, I'll figure out how to do a you know, return oriented programming for you. I saw a talk that Dino did at uh, Black Hat, you know, I'm a, and I'm like, I know Dino. Why, why doesn't he propose through Cyber Fast Track? You know, we could do this a little faster, a little quicker. So we asked all the folks who submitted winning proposals um, as they come in and as they come on contract how long it takes them to write the contract. Because these were also barriers to entry. The, well, when I was at the loft, we looked and said, hey, what would it take to go get an NSF grant? Or what would it take to go get you know, funding from DARPA for us to do some of the cool research that we like sharing with everybody? Uh, and they were huge. They were like you know, 50, 60 pages. It was legalese. I couldn't make sense of what it needed. Um, and now when I'm on the inside, I see that some of the organizations that play that game, which is a different game than this one, you know, they spend teams of people. They spend thousands of dollars, tens of thousands sometimes, putting together these proposals because they're asking for millions of dollars over multiple years. You know, but you or I, if you're not part of one of those big organizations, and I like those organizations because they do good work in other areas, you know, that's not an opportunity where we can actually play and we can actually compete. So I asked, uh, part of the goal is to make it easier for you to access it in all ways. Have the government do the, the dirty work, the croft, make the sausage so that you can actually play. And the amount of time it's taken for an individual to put together a winning CFT proposal has varied from, in one case, two hours. Um, thanks, Moxie, you're, you're slightly different than most people. Um, <laughs> Uh, up to a couple, you know, a weekend, uh, up to like a week, you know, spending you know, a couple hours a day, you know, working on it, and that's it. Um, the proposal itself, rather than these 200 page proposals with costing and everything else, uh, is 17 pages, and we even have a template up there. And the template takes care of, I think, what, 10 of those pages for you? And then kind of guides you going, like, here's where you need to describe this. Uh, and I'm trying to think the other things. The, what it is, is it's all firm fixed price. It's not like the traditional government contracts where it's something called cost plus fee. It's firm fixed price. It's like the commercial stuff that you've seen. So you decide how, when, and where you want to get paid and for what for. So if you say like, well, I'd like to get paid every three weeks, make a deliverable, like whether it's a status update, a report, a code drop, something else, you know, and put that in and that's when you get paid. That's what triggers it. You say it's going to compile and do the following at date X, you send it in, the technical team that we have compiles it, it does what you said it does, the check gets cut, and I think the uh, Charlie Miller and some of the guys uh, who were on this uh, said, yeah, they were surprised because they submitted their, their work and it was like a two-day turnaround time. I mean, the, the check's cut and it goes out. You don't have to have a bank account. You don't have to have them wire it to you. They'll even you know, cut you. This is a commercial-looking contract because I needed the government and I need the government to change in certain ways that we can actually uh, embrace a huge talent pool that I think you know, really needs the resources. These are the first 29. This is a little bit of an eye chart, but uh, I'll let folks uh, take it in. Uh, I tell the performers, the only thing we expect as far as public disclosure, because you go like, well, I don't want you giving away like my intellectual property because you designed it such that 
you know, me, the performer, gets to keep the intellectual property is I'd like to be able to put your name up in the title of the, uh, of the program. Some folks said that's fine, and they use titles for their efforts like Hungarian Ham. Fine by me. Uh, please don't make it obscene. Uh, you'll recognize some of these folks. The, you know, they're us. You've got you know, Immunity, that's Dave Itell. You've got Charlie Miller. You've got Raphael Mudge. Uh, you've got uh, Adam uh, out of Deja Vu Security. You've got Dan Farmer from you know, some of you folks who remember like Satan and Cops and uh, the Coroner's Toolkit. Uh, you've got, uh, <laughs> actually, you know, I'll let you guys guess where they are, but you've got sprinklings of DD Tech and School of Root throughout there too. That's pretty darn cool. Now there are some things these, these winning proposals have in common, and I'll just I'll really quickly walk you through there. Maybe it'll help you get ideas. All of these, because these are all being run unclassified, they're all defensive in nature. Okay? This is just something that the DOD does. If, if you want to do something offensive, we're interested in that, but we won't be able to run it in an unclassified uh, environment. I don't think that's much of a problem for the following reason. I've made a history of writing offensive tools. There are also defensive tools. Loft crack. Well, is it a password cracker for evil hackers? Or is it a way of auditing your own defenses and the strengths of the passwords that the people in your organizations are using? <laughs> Do you? Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but the commercial loft crack is, you know, is, is, is that. Uh, disclosure, I still own part of that company. Um, and I'm not trying to uh, put those two together here. Uh, Anti-sniff, which is a strange one, you know, it did what I thought was some really clever ways of determining based upon latencies of other systems whether that system was actually in promiscuous mode receiving traffic unintended for it without having to be on the system. And uh, people go like, well, that's almost always defensive because you're trying to find where the sniffers are on your networks. I said, yeah. Or I'm the person in your networks, and I'm trying to figure out where your IDS and network intrusion detection and where your host monitors and, and, and Armand probes are because I want to avoid those. You know, so I almost, I'm, I'm almost at the point where I can kind of like definitively say, if you can't describe a defensive and an offensive purpose for your program or your idea, you might not have a full handle on what your idea is yet. Um, but that being said, these are all defensive programs. <laughs> they are. I, I, can, I, can, I can take an antivirus uh, deployment and I can beat you over the head, of, you know, the head with it. You can't stop, stop somebody from taking a defensive tool or taking a hammer that's used to build a house and from cracking somebody's skull. It's just the nature of, of what it is. Um, but it was only uh, a couple of months ago uh, that DARPA actually uh, decided to change uh, their, uh, um, uh, their internal and their official um, classification guides and say, like, yes, we are actually interested in uh, cyber. Um, perhaps that was a tip of the hat to the whole, I don't, we've got much work in here. I don't know how long we can like, just kind of go like, yeah, we don't do that stuff. Um, we're always interested in it. You have to be interested in it because you don't want the worst case scenario to come as a surprise. You really don't. Um, these are the official links uh, right here. So all of the actual information is in what's called the DARPA PA 1152. You can Google for that. I tried to make that as humanly readable as possible. Uh, that is still an official government document. Uh, so as such, there are things like, if you plan on doing human testing or animal testing, you need to fill out the following. Please don't submit stuff that you're saying like we need to do animal testing on or, or, or human testing. I mean, if, if, if you have to, it's a, if it's a valid research thing that's cyber and cybersecurity related and, you know, I don't know what it is, you know, do it because we have the correct process to go through to make sure it's ethical, to make sure it's safe and everything. But, you know, they wouldn't let me take certain boilerplate out. Okay. Yeah, humans are animals. I don't know. What wine are you serving, sir? Um, <laughs> uh, so the, uh, if, what we also do is I, I go around and I do a full cyber fast track um, kind of talk, the genesis of it, how it works behind the scenes, uh, and uh, um, um, do a question and answer session. And we go around and do these town halls at different hacker spaces, maker labs. If you want one in your area, send an email to cyberfasttrack at darpa.mil. The reason that we do this is that historically for the traditional programs and traditional government contracts, 
you would have to get on a plane and fly potentially across the country to go attend an industry day to figure out if it's something you're even interested in, in participating in. This way, I'll come out to you, I'll talk to you for an hour. If it's not something you're interested in, you only lost an hour of your time. That's the goal. That's how I'm trying to change the stuff inside here. If you are interested, great. Um, the best resource out there is the community. So like Raphael Mudge uh, submitted a winning proposal and uh, he, he wrote a nice blog entry about it. And he said like, here's how I approached it. Here's what I read in the PA. Here's what I think they were encouraging. Here's what I think they were discouraging. And he shared it and I really liked that. I can't endorse it or, you know, not endorse, you know, I, I can't have an opinion on it other than it was valuable for him to, ex to, to share his experience. Some other folks are actually taking their proposals that one and they said, I'd like to put it through for release so I can just share the actual technical proposal with the community so they can see what won. So I think that's fantastic. Now go find somebody that proposed that didn't win and ask them also because maybe they'll, you know, have ideas of, you know, why, why theirs didn't work. I can give you some, some tips which are uh, one person submitted I think like eight or nine proposals simultaneously. Um, so I read them. Some were better than others. Uh, but they all had like a common flaw across them that did not allow me to select them. So if you have multiple ideas, think about spacing them out such that if you get a rejection, you can go, hmm, you know, oh, yeah, probably didn't like this one. You can change it on the next one. Maybe you'll have a better chance. Because we've had folks that do that, and they've actually nailed it. And we go like, no, not interested, and they change it around, submit it again, different ones like, oh, yeah, yep, that's fundable. So what I have to do uh, in order to get money out to you is I have to be willing to go in front of Congress and hold up this little proposal that you wrote and said, you know, as a steward of the, t of the taxpayer's money, I funded this with the taxpayer's money and this thing stands on its own. This is why this is so awesome. And I can cite stuff from it and I can point to it. And I'm comfortable doing that with any of, with, with, with any of those. You know, they're outstanding. Um, what makes a bad proposal or one that's not, you know, able to be chosen is if it's vague, it's like, I want to do some work in this area, so I'll need some money, you know. Because then I got to go in front of Congress and go like, well, yeah, um, um, I, I just gave them some money, you know, sort of thing. And that doesn't always work out too well for the person standing in front of Congress. Uh, other real quick things, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll close this out. It's got to have a research component. Uh, if it's just an engineering thing, I'm not going to be able to fund it. Doesn't mean it's not valuable, doesn't mean it's not hard, but it's got to have a research component to it because DARPA fund is, funds research. And it's got to have a security angle to it because that's my area of expertise. I've been in this field for going on 25 years now. So since I have to do the technical evaluation on it, you know, it's got to be something that I know about. If you want to do something in biotech or something else, yeah, I'm, I'm not your man. And, you know, they don't have a cyber fast track. They don't have a bio fast track uh, program yet. I hope they will soon. Uh, it's got to be technically specific and it's got to demonstrate just, you know, a clear understanding of what the state of the art is out there and how your idea is different from it, how it fills a gap. You know, if you're wishy-washy on those, it, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging uh, to fund. Now, <clears throat> folks have said historically, like, well, I don't know, you know, sounds too good to be true. We get money, we get to keep the IP, we don't have to go through the same sort of like, you know, proposal process and everything. What is it that you're actually getting on this? And, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's not enough for me to say, well, I want to show folks that there are new ways to solve problems and that we don't have to keep going down that blue line. Um, but the other thing is I'm trying to do a little bit of, you know, positive subversion uh, of my own. So other DOD contracting offices, you know, in the Air Force, in the Navy and everything, have to take note to this now. And they have, because they're like, wow, we can't do this with any of our stuff. How did they manage to do it? Um, and they're actually starting to adopt parts of it. So it creates a new option for different areas of research funding. You know, that's the change I'm trying to impart here. You know, when Cyber Fast Track eventually goes away, hopefully it'll just be Cyber Fast Track that's gone, but there's a new avenue to get research out to individuals and fund, re and fund research um, being performed by, you know, these folks that historically haven't been able to uh, haven't been able to play. I have not been able to do this by any stretch of the imagination by my own. Uh, I have a team of technical folks that help out the performers on the projects that provide technical resources to them uh, and that even do uh, um, depot management. And I'll, uh, are the BitSys guys here? BitSys, can you guys stand up real quickly? Um, they're around. They know how the sausage is made. 
Uh, they know what's going on because they work with all of the folks that are on here. If you have questions, find those guys. They'll be more than happy to, uh, to answer them. You know, they create VPN environments, uh, SVN stuff. If you don't want to use your own environment and you want to use that, they'll stand it up. They'll stand up systems. They also are doing something for me which I'm really, really happy about. Let me tell you, I'll wrap up with um, this is a little inside thing because I had to figure out how to hack contracting, right? So I look at all the existing contracts and, and I'm running several of the large ones and I'd see performers come up and they'd say in their first uh, program review, well, the first like, you know, first three months, not on Cyber Fast Track, these are other programs, you know, what we did is we put together our lab. We went out and bought hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of stuff to test it on and uh, it's in place and, you know, we've installed VMware or something else on it and I'm like, wow, we keep doing this over and over and over again. And I didn't exactly understand why. Um, until it dawned on me, cost plus fee is the contract vehicle, and these people make fee. They make profit for buying the equipment each time. And, and sometimes, thank you, uh, and sometimes uh, at the, after the program's done, they'll even charge the government rent for the old stuff that was there as they go out and buy new equipment again for the next project with it just sitting there in warehouses. And this just brings up images of like Raiders of the Lost Ark with this huge, like, you know, all these boxes. Now, I was from the loft. We put together all of our stuff from the dumpsters. You know, we had like 30, 40 uh, uh, micros. We had a massively parallel processing supercomputer. I mean, we were technology reclamation experts. You know, that's what we had to. We didn't have access to this. And the small organizations, I went, well, wait a second. We have basically a hangar out by Dulles Airport. And I went out to the other program managers and to my contracting officers. I said, go collect all of that equipment from all of these other contracts and ship it to that, airport, that uh, airplane hangar in Dulles. We're going to give it out to the CFT performers because they don't get profit for buying this stuff. And if they have a use for it, we could just ship it out to them because the government already bought it with taxpayer money. And that's what we're doing. We're going to make that list uh, um, available, probably Excel spreadsheet. It'll be quasi up to date, I imagine, as we start shipping stuff in and out. And the other thing is, don't, there's two, two reasons I'm really excited about this. One is you can go look at the list and just get ideas. Wow, that's a $275,000 Juniper router. If I had that, here's what I'd try and do. And come up with a proposal, you know, and if we, cause we could just ship that thing out to you. You know, and when you're done, you ship it back, somebody else can have a whack at it or have fun. You know, for a research sort of thing that you always wanted to do but you couldn't afford it. You know, you need, you know, and, and if it's stuff that we don't have on the list, that's okay. Propose the equipment that you need to do your project and it'll be purchased, you know, we'll give you the money to do it, it becomes government equipment, and when you're done, it goes back into that list also. Because if you needed it, some other performer would probably want to use it as well. Now, if you're doing it for a destructive thing, you know, because you need to tear it apart, that's fine. We'll abandon it in place out there and it's done. You know, if it gets older stuff, we can just abandon certain things in place. That's okay. Um, I was handed the, uh, the, the real quick uh, reminders. Yeah, 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 CNO. Um, oh, so if you want to negotiate, when, when, you, when you submit your stuff and you get the contract, um, there's really no negotiation on it. It's a firm fixed price thing. You said what it was. You said the money. Um, so if you want to negotiate and go back and forth on that, we have those traditional vehicles for you. I, I invite you to make use of them. Uh, eligibility for funding. This is an important one. You know, I'm a foreign national. I'm whatever. You know, can, can, I, can I fund? The only requirement that we have is that you're able to sign a legal contract, which means in the U.S., I think, you know, you have to be 18 years of age. We haven't had somebody who's under 18 who's had to have a, you know, a guardian or a parent sign for them yet, but we're open to that too. You know, folks have good ideas. So yes, this, is, this isn't something, you know, bounded by borders um, in that traditional way. And the town halls have to be open to the public because all the information that we share has to be shared to the largest, widest audience possible to make sure it's all fair. You know, so... <clears throat> That's my update from last year. So in closing, you know, what do I do? I hack. I hacked prior to the loft. I hack at the loft. Um, I hacked from the outside. I thought I made some, some significant contributions to the, uh, to the industry and to the environment. I thought I actually managed to make some change uh, to the government from the outside, and I got the opportunity to go inside. 
the government and create a program like this and hopefully you know you look at it that I'm still hacking and whether or not I'm successful is whether or not you actually get value out of it. So thank you very much. Thank you.